That word represents many different things to different people. Now, if you have just turned 16 years old, and you're walking out of the Department of Motor Vehicles for the very first time with your driver's license, well, freedom, freedom is getting behind the wheel of that automobile without a parent beside you, setting the seat back as far as you want it, cranking the music up as loud as you like, putting your shades on and getting the road, right? Cruising all the way to Ingalls and back to pick up a guy in the middle for your mom. For that what is what freedom is if you are 16 years old. Freedom. If you are a beagle, like our blessed little Julie was, freedom is those rare occasions when someone forgets and leaves the backyard fence gate open and you make it all the way around to the front yard of the house. You could see it in her eyes when she do it. The sparkle in her eyes said, I have found freedom. <laughs> freedom. If you're like many of us in the masses of the great American middle class, buried in an avalanche of consumer debt with mortgage payments and second mortgage payments and car payments and credit card payments and cable TV and cell phone and garbage pickup and all those other countless payments made to pay for this great American dream. If you're in that position, then freedom Freedom is finally holding in your hand that statement or document that says, pay in full. Amen. You know, the Hebrew tradition of Jubilee, are you familiar with that? Yes. Every 50 years, debts were forgiven, wiped clean. I kind of think America should adopt that. <laughs> Freedom. Now, if you're about to approach that magic year, for some, it's 65. For me, I think it's going to be 67. But that year, for, that, for the first time in nearly 50 or more years, you don't have to wake up to an alarm clock. You don't have to punch a time clock. You don't have to answer to a supervisor besides maybe your spouse. Then to you, retirement may mean freedom. Freedom. If failing health, a recent surgery has kept you from coming and going as you once did. Running out the door, jumping in the car, off you go. Then the first trip outside the house, even if it's just to the post office, might, might be freedom. 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 If you can't go a day without alcohol, or crack, or meth, or an opioid, and your life is just unraveling around you. No job, lost a job, lost your home, lost your family, lost your self-respect. Then sobriety is free. It's free. Freedom. If you have ever literally been behind bars, locked away in a facility for something you've done or been accused of doing, then to one day walk beyond those bars and gates and fences means freedom. Freedom. If you've lived the life of a tenant farmer, like folks in the Old Testament did, even folks in our own American history did, landlessness means poverty Oppression. And then to finally have a plot of land to call your own, well, that's freedom. Freedom. You remember the young Chinese dissident who in 1989 courageously stood before a tank on Tiananmen Square? Freedom meant the opportunity to have ideas different from the ruling government and express those, those ideas without fear of reprisal or even death. It's that same dream of freedom which shaped the writing of our nation's founders penned in the first ten amendments to our Constitution called the Bill of Rights. Freedom for Americans who for more than a century and a half 
lived under that Bill of Rights but were not afforded the benefits of that Bill of Rights because of the color of their skin or because they were born female and not male, freedom may be the equal opportunity guaranteed by law under the belief that all persons, all persons are created equal and therefore are deserving of the same chance for life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Freedom. What it means to you depends a lot upon where you are in your life and who you are in this world. But the Apostle Paul in his writings to the Galatians talks about a freedom that truly transcends culture and gender and generation and place in life. For, for Paul says, for freedom, Christ has set us free, so do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. If there ever were a people who understood what it meant to not have freedom, it was the people to whom Paul was writing. For not only did they live under the governmental bondage of the, of the Roman Empire, but they also had been enslaved by the religious bureaucracy of their own people. For, for the faith of Abraham had been perverted. It had been made into this ritualistic, rule-bound, institution-preserving, spiritually suffocating organization. Nitpicking and naysaying and tattletelling and self-righteous religious types had turned this dynamic relationship between God and God's people into this endless web of rules and bureaucracy in which love for God and love for one another had got completely lost. Now, it's easy for us to step back and read the stories of the Pharisees and shake our heads and in their pettiness and gloat as Jesus rebukes them, but, but it happens even today in the, among God's people, even in our own United Methodist family of faith. Sometimes spiritual suffocation by the tangle of rules of bureaucracies found in our institutions. And while we need some rules to keep things in order, we must never squelch the passion of our faith and the willingness to go with the movement of the Spirit. We must be careful that the priority of love, love for God, love for one another, and yes, even love for ourselves doesn't get lost in trying to make sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to do right. <laughs> Paul says we have been called to freedom. Evidently, some in the early days of the Christian faith interpret that statement to mean, if it feels good to me, I ought to do it. In other words, they saw freedom as a license to abandon any sense of responsibility or accountability to others. Yet nothing could be further from Paul's intentions. In fact, History has proven over and again, and perhaps your own life experience has proven over and again, that without self-discipline, there is no true freedom. The man or woman who cannot say no to his or her own impulses is a man or woman enslaved, not free. self is a cornerstone to freedom. The freedom which we are granted through faith in Christ is a freedom which allows us to experience the fruits of the Spirit. And in this freedom, we find things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. That the message of Christ boils down to just this. God loves you. Amen. And God loves me. Period. There, there's no comma, there's no connector, but 
if, only if, God loves you and God loves me, what's the next, what's the next grammar uh, designation we put there? Period. Right? And because we know we are loved, we're accepted, we're secure. Because of that, we are free. Free to move beyond our guilt, free to move beyond our selfishness, free to move beyond our fear, free to move beyond the despair that sometimes overshadows us, and to risk loving others with that very same kind of unconditional love that God has loved us with. Free. Mm. I hope this morning we cherish that freedom. Freedom we enjoy as citizens of a wonderful nation, although imperfect in many ways, still its roots standing for freedom. I hope that we value the freedom that we worship in this morning. Isn't it nice to be able to gather here? No one's telling us what we do or have to do or can't do. We have the freedom to express our own opinion and the freedom others possess to express theirs. But most of all this morning, I hope we cherish the fact that through Christ, we have been set free Amen. from our burdens, from our fears, from our guilt, from our doubt. Set free to serve and live and love, just like he did. Set free to know the joy and peace and hope of an abundant life in a kingdom, a kingdom that is not built on money or possessions or power, but a kingdom established on the rich fertile soil of God's everlasting and steadfast love. Turn to somebody this morning and say these words. God loves you. <laughs> Without a doubt, in our individual lives and in the life of our community and our nation and the world, we face many struggles and challenges. Uh, there are many barriers to overcome. There are, there are many uh, uh, painful things from which we need healing. There are many problems that seem to us to be insurmountable, unsolvable. But when we are people of faith, and we believe that statement you just said to somebody here this morning, God loves you then there is no burden too great. There is no wall too high. There is no problem too difficult for us to not overcome. Do you believe that today? We can do it, right? We can do it. We're going to sing. And, and I picked this song out. Uh, this also, I believe, is a patriotic song. This was a song adopted in the civil rights era as a, really a hymn of faith and promise so that this great country in which we live would the, the, the founding principles could finally be, be, uh, be afforded to all of our citizens. Um, you know, even though we may not see everything today that we would hope would be, one day we're going to see it. It's all going to come to pass. God's, God's way is going to be the way that the world will adopt. Uh, in the meantime, we, we, we continue on as people of faith. Uh, we shall overcome one day, right? We shall. So uh, as we sing this hymn, if you would like to come to this altar, uh, I'd be happy to pray with you. Uh, and I'm going to ask John if he'll come.